Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation on the Pulse Series, where we have a special physician cardiology and cardiovascular surgery uh, speak on various topics that we feel are of interest to you. Today uh, is a great one. It's uh, the history of heart surgery by my friend and colleague, Dr. Bobby Steffen, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, my name is Scott Sharkey, and I'm a cardiologist here, have been for a long time, and I'm the chief medical officer um, and president of the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Um, I think uh, at, at the start I will say that this week has uh, left an indelible mark on each of us, and uh, like you, I am haunted by the question of uh, how could this happen in our beloved state. And so as we grapple with the magnitude of this crisis, um, I have no doubt that the people of Minnesota will rise to the challenge, as they always have, to discover meaningful and durable solutions. So just a few feet behind me is the uh, campus of the Abbott Northwestern Hospital. And uh, I want to tell you I'm just so proud of the nurses and the doctors and the support staff who have endured the stress of the past several days to provide exceptional and uninterrupted care of our patients in the midst of social unrest and the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm very happy to report to you that all is well here right now and our patients are getting the very best. Well, at this time, it's really important to celebrate all of the positive contributions which have come from this wonderful state. And I can really think of no finer example than the healthcare, research, and education. The Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation was created in 1982 by visionary physicians who recognized the importance of cardiovascular research and education in improving the lives of all of our patients. Today, more than 39 years later, we continue this essential work. Before I have Dr. Stefan come up, I just want to spend a second to tell you about the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation and its relationship with our practice, the Minneapolis Heart Institute, and with our parent, the Alina Health Organization. The, we are sort of a triumvirate of three um, separate but important uh, different organizations. The, the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, as you know, is a nonprofit and relies on the generosity of our community and our physicians to carry forth our, our uh, mission of uh, research and education. And so we're very proud to be a part of Alina Health and a very par pr proud to be a part of the Minneapolis Heart Institute phys physician practice. I think most importantly on a day like today is to share with you uh, one of the things we're most proud of, which is our internship program, which dates back to 2002. And since that time, we have allowed 192 young students, college-age students, to spend the whole summer with us learning research and education with our doctors. And this photograph illustrates last year's class, and I think it's important to recognize the diversity of gender and race and geography represented by this class, and this has been a part of our philosophy ever since we started this program. And every year we hear from these students as to how much this program has met, meant to them in their, in their personal and professional lives. At the same time, we have given 11,000 hours of professional community student and patient education, and we've produced over 200 pub publications sharing our research in leading journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association. We're really very proud of that. Our research, we, this is a team that has been involved in, in research for valvular heart disease. We have more than 200 studies consistently underway and 2,200 patients uh, participating in these uh, studies. About half of our research is sponsored by industry, uh, and on the other half is initiated by our own physicians. Our 
research and education has had impact around the world for patients, for other physicians, and for other healthcare providers. And most importantly, a message to send is we're so grateful to each of you who have been so kind to us and, and supported us and to our patients to whom this makes our work so worthwhile. So at this point, I want to take the moment to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Bobby Steffen. Um, Bobby is a cardiovascular surgeon and he's a native of Burnsville, Minnesota. He is a biomedical engineer, which means I have a hard time talking to him unless it's about non-medical things, and in which case it's really easy to talk to him. He graduated uh, from Northwestern University undergrad and received his medical degree from, the, of course, the University of Minnesota. And he went on to do his cardiovascular surgery training at the Cleveland Clinic and, and distinguished himself uh, by being awarded the Charles Bryan Award for Clinical Excellence. And I can tell you with my experience with him here, I'm no surprise that that award came. Um, well, Bobby uh, has several interests in cardiovascular surgery, I think most notably in the area of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which has a surgical treatment and also in the repair and replacement of the mitral valve. And he has spoken to this crowd before, and so we've invited him back um, because of his um, uh, great work in the past. And so, Bobby, why don't you uh, join me? I, wa I want to start by saying that if it were not for Minnesota, cardiovascular surgery might not even exist. Um, I, I note that Dr. Uh, Christian Barnard from South Africa, who did the very first human heart transplant years ago, received his surgical training at the University of Minnesota. So, Bobby, please uh, step up and thank you very much. Thanks, Scott, and thanks to the Foundation for uh, inviting me to give you guys a, <coughs> a talk today. This talk will be about, uh, hopefully, about half of some content I've uh, come up with, and then hopefully the rest of it will be questions that you guys have. So today we'll talk about the history of heart surgery. So <coughs> for a long time, uh, surgeons were very reluctant to go anywhere near the heart. They thought that it held mysterious powers, and if you touched it, the patient would immediately die. So uh, while all sorts of other surgery was, were being explored, heart surgery was not, uh, not uh, explored. So the first heart surgery wasn't actually until 1896. So and the story is pretty interesting. So um, <clears throat> the surgeon on the left, uh, Ludwig Rain, was the first uh, heart surgeon. And the patient story is actually quite interesting. Um, so this is the original um, description from the original publication. So WJ, a gardener, was recently discharged from the military from an irregular heartbeat. Approximately a week later, he sustained a knife wound during the walk and, fe <clears throat> and fell to the ground unconscious. He was found a couple hours later. So the next day at 3.30, uh, he arrived at the hospital. By September 9th, so two days after he was stabbed, a decided deterioration was noted. He was getting sicker. And they put a needle in his chest and they found dark blood. So <clears throat> uh, he was dying. There was no other option. He needed to be... Uh, undergo some surgical procedure, and so this gentleman, Ludwig Rain, was, was willing to give it a chance. And this is what he did. So uh, the picture on the left, you can see he made a, a large incision just left of the midline of the chest, went through the skin, went through the muscle, went through the bone, and exposed the left side of the, uh, the right side of the heart. And what he found was a stab wound that was slowly bleeding, and the uh, <clears throat> the blood from the heart was collapsed. The blood was coming out of the heart and collapsing the chambers of the heart, and the patient was slowly dying. So, um, what he did was th he exposed the stab wound and put a couple stitches in to repair the hole, and <clears throat> uh, to great success. So, uh, in his publication, this is what he said, gentlemen. The feasibility of cardiography or putting any sort of stitches or, or repair of anything on the heart no longer remains in doubt. 
I need not fear any objections as to its propriety. The operation not only was life-saving, but prevented the subsequent development of constrictive pericarditis, which is a, if you get a lot of blood stuck around the heart, it can uh, impair the, the heart's ability to expand and contract. So not only did it immediately save the patient's life, but it prevented future deterioration. I think this case will not only remain a curiosity, but rather that the field of cardiac surgery will be further investigated. Let me speak once more my conviction that by means of, the car of cardiography, many lives can be saved that were previously counted as lost. So a little over 120 years ago, a patient got stabbed in the heart. No surgery was done for approximately two days. Finally gets surgery and uh, the rest is uh, history. So, <clears throat> fast, so as much of that first 40 or 50 years was um, um, just like this, trauma to the heart, things like that. Um, but we weren't really doing any sort of uh, operations to improve a diseased heart in an elective state. So uh, the next real breakthrough was about 60 years later. So this is the first angiogram. So at that time, people had been putting dye in large arteries to look for aneurysms and things like that, to measure, to, to look for vascular abnormalities. But they hadn't been doing that inside the arteries to the heart because they were scared. They didn't want to uh, do anything that would cause uh, immediate, immediate problems with the heart that wouldn't be able to be repaired. So what happened was <clears throat> there was a, a guy in Cleveland who was doing um, an angiogram just like you see on the left, and the catheter, unknowingly to him, slipped in the coronary artery. So when he went to inject the dye, it filled up. So you can see here on the, on the right, that, that squiggly line along the left side of the picture is the first angiogram. So dye was shot into the coronary artery. They could see what it looked like. And <clears throat> uh, when it happened, they were very scared that something would happen, the patient would have an arrest or something, but, but they didn't. So it was a real breakthrough. Now we're able to not only do angiograms and visualize blood vessels on the large scale, but we can do it on a small scale. So that was not that long ago, 1958. So that really <clears throat> uh, allowed us to do uh, the number one operation still today, which is coronary artery bypass. So they started injecting dye into people's arteries and they found these blockages. So just like you see on, on the right here, that's a normal smooth caliber artery, but oftentimes when they were doing it, they would find blockages. So the next major breakthrough in heart surgery was coronary bypass. So it was finding a way to get blood around those arteries. So this gentleman on the left is uh, Rene Favolaro. He's an Argentinian surgeon who was working uh, in Cleveland at the same time they were doing a lot of the angiogram. So uh, the solution he came up with was this. So to use some sort of conduit to bypass blockages and arteries to the heart. So they would get an angiogram, find a blockage, be sent to the operating room, and get bypass. So this is similar to the, our, it's, it is the same operation that we do today, and there's all sorts of different ways that you can do it. So at that time, they were exclusively using veins from the leg. Um, as you can see on the left, that's all sorts of different arteries that we use for bypass. So there's <clears throat> still veins in the legs that we can use. There's arteries from inside the wall of the chest next to the heart. We almost always use one of them, oftentimes two. There's arteries in the arm, arteries in the stomach, and arteries down in the belly, um, all of which can be used for, um, for bypass. So this was really the next major uh, breakthrough, was not only diagnosing blockages in the arteries, but having a way to treat them. So <clears throat> with coronary artery bypass, you're working on the outside of the heart. The heart can still be beating. The, you don't need to go inside the heart at all. So um, this could be done uh, without the assistance of any sort of um, support. But the problem was there's a lot of <coughs> issues inside the heart that need to be fixed. Holes in the heart, valves that aren't working, um, uh, blockages or, or in <coughs> aneurysms of the aorta. Anything inside the heart can't be done with, without any sort of support. So a major um, uh, breakthrough was cardiopulmonary bypass. So it was a way to support 
the rest of the body while you were operating on the heart. So the heart has two functions. One, it pumps blood to the lungs so that oxygen can be added to the blood and carbon monoxide can be re removed. And then it pumps blood to the rest of the body. So that, those are the two functions that need to be maintained if you're not going to uh, allow the heart to do its work. So what cardiopulmonary bypass does is, it, as you can see in this picture, it takes blood from around <coughs> uh, the, the right side of the heart, it drains the heart, it puts it into a, a, a reservoir where it's, uh, gets the blood gets oxygen and carbon monoxide is removed, and then uh, blood is pumped to the rest of the body. So that allowed for us to start operating inside the heart. So the rest of the body could be protected, the brains, the kidneys, the belly, while you're operating on the heart. So um, <clears throat> that was a really critical part to advancing heart, uh, heart surgery. So this is uh, what the bypass machine more or less looks like here on the right. So it seems, this is an easy schematic where uh, blood is drained into a res reservoir, through a filter and pump back in, but this is actually what it looks like. So this is the reservoir. There are many different pumps that are doing different things at the same time. So uh, this was invented around the same time as the as coronary bypass was getting uh, was starting to gain steam. So <clears throat> one of the first, one of the early advances was neonatal heart surgery. So there were all of these kids that were uh, being born and uh, weren't doing well. And there really was uh, <clears throat> only a couple treatments that could palliate them at the time um, that didn't need bypass. But it, in order to really fix what was going on, they needed this bypass machine so that they could support the rest of the kid while they were starting to do surgery. So this is one of the um, uh, common neonatal heart surgeries. So this is called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. As you can, this is what it looks like on the left. So uh, this is the left ventricle, the major pump to the left side of the heart. And as you can see, this is the right ventricle. Compared to the right ventricle, the left ventricle is very small. So it, it's unable to sufficiently pump the amount of volume that the rest of the body needs. So before, kids, really, kids with this really had no option. So uh, once cardiopulmonary bypass came into um, became available, we were able to start to create operations to treat kids like this. So what we do here, this is called the Norwood operation. So um, in, since we, they only have one ventricle, we can't create a second ventricle. A, this right ventricle is used to pump blood to the rest of their body. And there's this uh, separate conduit that's used to pump blood to their lungs. So um, major breakthrough in the ability to treat uh, what was almost a universally lethal condition. Uh, this is about sometime in the 1980s. So another uh, <coughs> real breakthrough in a, in a lethal condition is uh, transposition. So uh, in this, the, the way the heart develops, the heart and the blood vessels out of the heart develop somewhat independently. So in patients with transposition, blood that's supposed to go to the lungs that's coming back from the rest of the body gets pumped to the rest of the body, and blood that's supposed to go to the rest of the body goes to the lungs. And the problem is that blood that comes back from the rest of the body never gets a chance to go to the lungs. So it never gets oxygen, it never gets carbon dioxide, so <coughs> carbon dioxide removed. So uh, it's a uniformly quickly lethal condition as soon as a small remnant from their childhood or from, from their pregnancy um, uh, closes. So what, uh, <clears throat> what we're able to do now is actually what's called the switch operation. So the patients go on cardiopulmonary bypass and you just switch these two arteries around. You can uh, replace the pulmonary, uh, sorry, yeah, the pulmonary artery with the uh, aorta and blood can be rerouted in the correct position. So now moving on to more adult diseases. So aortic valve disease this is the second most common operation we do. Cor coronary bypass is still the first most common. This is the second most common. And this is what a diseased aortic valve looks like. So it can either be on the top left, you can see a tricuspid aortic valve, three leaflets, or a bicuspid split in two. 
uh, bicuspid valves. And what happens is when you get older, typically it's patients in their 60s or 70s or 80s, you get these calcium deposits on the valve. And so two things can happen. One, like this, the valve cannot open very well because it, there's all, these, all this calcium, it, it, the leaflets aren't very mobile. Or this can happen where the valve doesn't close very well. So valves have two, two purposes, to allow forward flow and prevent back flow. And either one of those can fail. So <clears throat> when that happens, the valves need to be replaced. So this is the, one of the first uh, heart valves that was ever created. It's called the Star Edwards valve. And it's, it's uh, this ball. So you take out the old valve and you put this in the spot of the old valve, the sewing ring, and the ball serves as the valve function. So as the heart pumps out, that ball gets ejected into this cage and blood's allowed to go forward. And then when um, uh, the heart's not contracting, the ball falls back into this hole, blocks blood from being uh, from going back into the heart and serves the valve function, allows forward flow, prevents back flow. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, this was uh, could be kind of noisy and peop uh, people would, uh, as your heart beats 60, 70, 80 times a minute, people could hear it and it would drive them crazy. So uh, we actually have some uh, more, some of the newer valves. So this is these are two of the more common ones we use now. This is the new mechanical valve, one of the new mechanical valves. Um, and then this is a tissue valve. So we use both of these. So the mechanical valve, uh, the benefit of it is it will tend to last forever. Um, the problem is you have to be on a blood thinner. And right now that's Coumadin. Um, we're, there are studies going on to see if you can get on a non-Coumadin blood thinner, but either way, the problem is that these discs can get little clots on them. So uh, in order for the valve to not uh, clot off or also send clots down to, to your brain or your kidneys, you have to be on a blood thinner. Another option is these tissue valves. So these are made of typically um, either the lining of a cow's heart or sometimes they're actually a pig's valve. Um, these do not, they function just as a normal valve. Um, so they don't require you to be on Coumadin, but they can degenerate just the same way as your native aortic valve does. And unfortunately, although your native valve may have lasted you 60, 70, or 80 years, sometimes these don't last quite as long. Usually, depending on your age and what size we put in, it can be 10, 10 or 15 years, sometimes up to 20 years. And then the newest way that we're replacing aortic valves is in the cath lab. So um, this is not surgery. We don't uh, open your chest. We don't put you on cardio cardiopulmonary bypass. We do it in a, in a room that looks like this. And <clears throat> it's called a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So uh, it's a valve. It goes in your groin. This is just a picture of the heart, but the valve goes up from your groin into your, uh, oops, into the blood vessels of your, um, uh, your aorta, and then across your valve, just like this. And then what happens is we uh, balloon the valve up and it grabs onto your native valve and secures itself in place. And then it's a normally functioning aortic valve. Uh, this is a recent and tremendous breakthrough uh, in the treatment of aortic valve disease. Patients who get, the, we're able to one, give this to patients who would not be able to tolerate open heart surgery. Uh, but also as we've been expanding its use more and more uh, we're using it in quite a few patients and they're able to uh, recover much quicker than from typical open heart surgery. So this is what it looks like from the cath lab pictures when we're doing it. So this is the, this is the valve, uh, this is the new valve across the aortic valve on the left. And as you can see, this is the valve expanded on the right. You can see the balloon uh, all around the rim and just pushes the old valve out of the way and seats itself in place. So some valves, uh, often the mitral valve, doesn't fail because it uh, gets calcified and doesn't open well, but actually sometimes opens too well. So this is um, a picture of the mitral valve. The mitral valve has two leaflets, the anterior and posterior leaflet. And when the heart contracts, it, require, it relies on these cords to prevent, to prevent the uh, leaflets from moving too much. And what can happen is these cords can break. So when the heart contracts, that part of the valve, such as this, when the heart contracts, doesn't 
closed. It flies right up into the left atrium, and the heart is allowed, or sorry, the valve um, uh, is incompetent, and blood will go the wrong way. So the heart will be pumping 100% of the blood it needs to the rest of the body, plus maybe 20% in the wrong direction. So in order to pump the blood that it needs to the rest of the body, the heart's working at 120, 130% of efficiency. So that's tolerated well for a little while, but if, you, if left that way, <clears throat> it can cause heart failure. So instead of just replacing an entire valve because one segment is moving too well, oftentimes what we can do is repair it. So this is a pretty common way that we'll treat the mitral valve. You go in, find the cord that's ruptured, take it out, and just sew, sew those two areas back together. So now that area of the valve is supported by cords that work well, and the patient's not required to take Coumadin. The valve won't degenerate over time and they were able to save their living valve. Our next major breakthrough is aneurysms. <clears throat> so this is the uh, aortic valve, arteries to your heart, and the ascending aorta. So <clears throat> oftentimes in patients, sometimes with bicuspid aortic valves, or if they have a connective tissue disease like Marfan's disease or Loewy's Dietz disease, or, uh, or sometimes just bad luck, their aortas can dilate. And we know as they dilate and they get bigger in the five, five and a half, six centimeter range, they have a higher risk of having issues. And by issues, I mean either tearing or rupturing. And so when we see patients like this, uh, <coughs> we, we need a way to replace their aorta, to get the diseased aorta out, but still allow blood flow um, from their heart to the rest of their body. So we'll do something like this, and I'll show you a, a picture of what exactly it looks like, but... <coughs> um, this is a uh, called a gel weave or a Dacron graft, and and um, <clears throat> it's it's sewn from the aortic valve all the way up to the aorta, right before the blood vessels to the head. Uh, so this allows us to take out the diseased aorta, prevent them from having an aortic dissection or an aortic rupture, uh, and this is done sometimes emergently, but hope uh, hopefully uh, in most cases it's done electively. And this is what it looks like. So. In this case, um, this is the Dacron graft. This is the graft material that we use. And then here, as you can see, that the aorta uh, is where the aortic valve sits. So sometimes patients have big aortas, but their aortic valve is just fine. So uh, in patients like that, we want to save their valve. We don't want to commit them to either lifelong blood thinners or having to change out their valve surgically every 10 or 20 years. So we can do something that saves the living valve. So in here, this is, a, this is a picture of a healthy, normal aortic valve compared to what I showed you before. So nice, thin leaflets, as you can imagine, when the heart contracts, they'll open easily. And then this closes. As you can picture, no blood's going to flow through here. The valve is, is closing. So this is another thing that's picked up over the last probably 20 years. Is It's called a valve-sparing aortic root replacement. So we're, repair, we're taking your diseased aorta out, but we're able to spare your aortic valve. So a couple more things that uh, we've been doing. So this is um, <coughs> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So patients have thick hearts in a bad place. So typically this happens right under your aortic valve. So your aortic valve works fine, but your heart's not able to pump blood out because as you can see, all this muscle encroaches right under their valve. So what happens, their heart goes to pump, they can't get around this obstruction, and it has to work harder and harder and harder. Sometimes they do okay with rest, but when they start to climb stairs, when they start to walk, when they start to run, they feel tremendously short of breath. So what we'll do is go in, take out all that muscle, leave the valve, and open up their uh, what's called the left ventricular outflow tract. So their heart, their heart now is able to pump freely blood out of the left ventricle. And this is what it looks like. It's not very much. It's about, we usually measure it. It's a few, or weigh it, I'm sorry. It's a few grams. It's uh, something four centimeters by three centimeters and not too thick, usually a few uh, millimeters thick. So it's not a lot of muscle inside your heart, but it's causing you a big problem. And lastly, what I'll talk about is surgery for heart failure. So <clears throat> this is um, this is a heart, that's a, a human heart that's about to go in for heart transplant. So um, a lot of this uh, research was actually done here in Minnesota. So 
A critical part to this is not only being able to technically do the operation, but their immunosuppression. So um, <clears throat> when you put a heart in, your body will recognize it as not your heart, and just like any sort of infection, it will start to fight it. And if it fights it, it the heart will stop working so well. So a critical part is figuring out how to prevent the heart from getting rejected. So <clears throat> much uh, the critical uh, kind of uh, step in figuring out how to do heart transplants, one of them was figuring out how to keep them properly immunosuppressed. And a lot of that work was done here at the University of Minnesota where they, were, they transplanted over 250 dogs and they worked seeing what sort of immunosuppression regimen would, would allow them to continue to um, allow the heart to, to uh, work, have the patient not reject the heart, but also have their immune system work well enough that they didn't get uh, infections like pneumonias and things like that that would uh, kill them. So this is, uh, uh, like I said, a heart, trans a heart that's about to go in for heart transplant. So uh, unfortunately, we have been unable to grow the heart transplant program over the last, this is nationwide, this is over the last 20 years. Sorry, some of these dates aren't coming in, but this is from the early 90s. These are our heart transplant numbers from the early 90s. So uh, as you can see, there's been essentially no growth from the early 90s up until now. And the, part of the reason is we just don't have donors that have uh, healthy hearts available to transplant. So um, one major uh, improvement has been left ventricular assist devices. So these are mechanical devices that function as your heart and they pump blood um, out of the left ventricle of your heart and into your aorta. So instead of taking your old, old, old heart out, these keep your heart in place and support it um, by doing the, the major function of the left ventricle of your heart. This is the third generation. These have been around for, uh, the HeartMate LVAD in general have been around for about 20 years. This one's been around for just a few, and it has been uh, tremendously successful. So um, <clears throat> what we're seeing is two-year survival with patients like this in the 75, 80% range. So you have heart failure so bad that you either need, need a heart transplant or an LVAD, and we're able to get you at least two more years, 75% of the time, so um, or more. So this has been a tremendous success. success. One other thing we're trying to do is improve our, uh, just to use more hearts for transplant than we've been using. So the process we used before was basically if we were gonna go to get a heart, we would take it, we'd go to the donor, take it out of the donor, put it in a cooler, just like, not quite like this, but we put it in a cooler, styrofoam cooler on ice and bring it back to the hospital and sew it in. So. We never really knew much about, we knew what the heart looked like before we took it out, but we didn't know what it looked like until it got put back in. So when you're trying to take more and more what we would consider risky hearts or, or just uncertain how good they are, if, if you have no way of testing them in the interim, it's, it becomes a very risky situation. So one thing we're doing here at MHI on the right is using this transmedic device. So we'll go to a hospital, take the heart out of the donor and put it on this machine. And you can't see, but this, this heart actually continues to beat. So we'll hook it up, we'll fill it, we'll pump it with its own blood, we'll take some of the blood from the donor, pump it with its own blood and see how well it works. So we'll give it four, six or eight hours and see, okay, well maybe that heart wasn't working so well, but if we put it on this machine, we've tested it, it's pumping well, we feel comfortable putting it in a patient. So. This is another way, besides the LVADs, of <clears throat> thinking that maybe we can um, improve our uh, treatment and our numbers of heart transplants. That's it. I look forward to hearing what sort of questions you have, and thank you again so much for your time. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stefan. We really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise. Uh, to the attendees, as Dr. Stefan mentioned, we will be opening it up for Q&A at this point. And Dr. Stefan, if you could just advance the slide just one more. We have some uh, directions for how to submit a question via Zoom. Uh, and the way to do that is to drag your cursor to the bottom of the screen, access the control bar, and go ahead and click on that Q&A button to submit a question or comment. 
Uh, and at this point, it looks like we have quite a few questions. So if you're ready, we sure. can start with that. Uh, the first question is, what type of heart surgery do you perform most often? So number one is coronary bypass. Um, we do here, it's probably 250 to 300 isolated coronary bypass a year. So that's still number one. Number two is aortic valve replacement, surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, that number is more in flux than, than the coronary bypass is as we're treating it in multiple different ways. As I said, now we're doing transcatheter valves and open valves. So that's that number is kind of more in flux. But number one, coronary bypass. Number two, aortic valve replacement. Excellent. Thank you very much. So this attendee is asking, is there an age at which people are no longer candidates for heart surgery in general? And how has that changed in recent years? Uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, we operate on um, certainly a lot of people in their mid to late 80s. Um, it's, so the technical parts of the operation are similar. So your tissue gets of a little bit less quality over time, so it holds our suture material a little bit less, but usually that's not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is how well the patient will tolerate a big operation. So how well do your lungs work? How well do your kidneys work? How active are you? If we knock you down for a couple of days, are you going to be able to get back up, get your strength back, have your organs work? Um, so we have really no reservations about people operating into their late operating on people in their late eighties, as long as we think that there's some benefit on the other side and that they can they can tolerate it. Right. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have quite a few questions left, so we appreciate your time again. Um, this attendee is asking, what would you say are the best preventative activities, food or physical exercise wise, uh, that a person can do to avoid the need for heart surgery? Best uh, physical activities? Uh, In food, yep. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of research that's constantly going into this. Um, Number one, the number one cause is bad luck, I would say, for valve disease, for coronary disease. There's a lot of people just bad genetics, bad luck. Um, <clears throat> keeping active, active multiple times a week, every week. Um, the, I'm not a diet expert. There's constantly uh, new studies being examined on every different diet, so I don't want to um, uh, speak out of terms. I just don't know. There's there are a few basic drugs that everybody gets put on for if they have blockages in their arteries. So a statin, a beta blocker, aspirin. Um, again, more drugs are constantly being come out are coming out to look at what if we get your triglycerides lower? What if we get your cholesterol lower? If we take it, we can take some of these numbers to almost zero. Uh, but the question is, does that help? And what are the negative effects? So. Um, just stay as active as you can, stay as healthy as you can, and uh, yeah, keep in close contact with your cardiologist if you have any problems, for sure. Excellent. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, so this attendee is asking, when a patient uh, sees a doctor at Abbott, can you talk about um, how, how, how it's a team effort? So are, are physicians talking to each other to collaborate with a patient? Yeah, so... Um, by the time they see me, everybody has a cardiologist. So um, we, uh, our strength really is uh, subspecialization and the talent we have in every different uh, field. So if you come to your cardiologist and maybe they do an echo and they say, well, maybe your valve looks moderate to severe, we're not really sure. Okay, well, let's talk to our imaging guys and see what is the best imaging to figure out what, um, the severity of your valve diseases. Is it an MRI? Is it a CAT scan? Do we need to take you to the cath lab to put some catheters in your heart and maybe stress your heart in the cath lab? And then they'll come see me and say, what do you think? Is this a good surgical candidate? What surgery would you do? How would you do the surgery? Um, is it better to do the surgery now while <clears throat> maybe they're a little healthier? Should we do everything we can to just wait? Um, um, uh, maybe... Um, you know, a year or two and see what, um, see if it gets better, see if it stays the same. And then for every, um, for every patient with a valve problem, we actually meet once a week and our imagers are there, our cardiologists are there, we're there, the research team is there. And so we all look at 
uh, all the studies. We all talk about what we've discussed with the patients, and we're able to give everybody their own personalized um, recommendation for what we think, whether or not it's open surgery, whether it's a catheter-based surgery, whether it's medical treatment, whether it's watching and following up in six months to a year. Um, so it's a very collaborative group. Yeah, it sounds like there's quite a bit of collaboration going on. Um, a follow-up question from the same attendees asking, if, if you want to see a specific doctor, is there a process of, um, do you know of a process to see a specific doctor? Do you mean like a specific subspecialty doctor or like any, just you want to meet a specific person? The latter, yeah. Oh, yeah, you just call their office and you can schedule an appointment with any one of us, any one of the surgeons or cardiologists. Um, we all have open schedules. You can call and request a specific uh, person and you can see them. Excellent, good to know. Um, another question is what role, if any, does stress have on a person's heart? So I'm assuming that could be physical, emotional, any type of stress. Um, I don't know the long term of that. Certainly we see people that have what we call a stress cardiomyopathy. So um, for whatever reasons, emotional, mental, physical stress, we see them come in with um, uh, their heart not working so well. Oftentimes those are recoverable situations. So um, if we see that the heart's not working too well and we can't find a good reason why, but we have maybe a, a, a potential stressor will put them on some good heart failure medications and uh, recheck them and see if it gets better. Right, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this attendee notes that you are a researcher um, and she's just wondering what research are you currently working on? So <clears throat> me specifically, um, I'm very involved in, in the uh, transcatheter valve, valve treatment area. So um, the two well, were really three valves, so the aortic mitral and tricuspid were all are all being actively evaluated for new um, treatments. So the transcatheter aortic valves is is a very well established, frequent. We do probably I don't know five or six of them a week. Um, the mitral where is a huge space for innovation and um, uh, growth. We're constantly working on ways to better do. Uh, mitral valve interventions through the groin and the same with the tricuspid so uh, that's a partnership with us and industry and uh, the uh, foundation finding ways to get patients um, better and, and newer treatments for their valve disease that's what I'm probably most heavily involved in and then um, we're also doing uh, uh, research on <coughs> surgical mitral valve therapy the best way to, to um, I showed you you can um, resect diseased mitral valve cords. Another way you can fix those is to put uh, an artificial cord in. So we're gonna take a look at our research, at our uh, series this summer and see which is better, resecting part of the valve or re replacing it with a neocord. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also doing surgery, or sorry, doing research on uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy surgery and, and guiding uh, the surgery with uh, CAT scans and, and understanding exactly at what level the obstruction is occurring and how thick it is. So um, that's another area. So a lot of valve stuff and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Excellent. And a follow-up question to that would be, how do patients or just people who are interested in this, research, in this research, how would they stay up to date with what's going on? So um, <clears throat> one, you can ask, every time you come to the clinic here, we have people available that um, or we, all, we all have research projects and uh, teams that are, uh, we consider you for what, what you think we could potentially help you with. Um, and then our website has um, uh, information on all the trials that we have going on. So either check our website or talk to, talk to us when you see us and we can tell you what research is going on in the area of heart disease that you have. Perfect, thank you. It looks like we just have a few more questions. Uh, the next of which is, could you bring any additional insight about the uh, contributions that Minnesota has made to open heart surgery? So whether it's you know a university or a physician from here, could you just expand on that a little bit? So both um, Mayo and the University of Minnesota have made tremendous impacts uh, in um, um, heart surgery. So Mayo is <clears throat> continues to be one of the busiest heart surgery programs in the, in the country and in the world, um, doing the complete breadth of um, cardiac surgery. So as I mentioned, the number one 
operation to reduce coronary bypass. Number two is aortic valve disease, but there are all sorts of different ways that your heart can fail. And so um, <coughs> uh, surgeons in Rochester and the Twin Cities have all been uh, innovators in finding different new solutions, both open and uh, transcatheter to treat really any problem your heart can have from conduction disease, uh, arrhythmias, um, uh, like a, a <clears throat> malformations in your valvular apparatuses that can hopefully allow you to, uh, to, us to repair and keep your valves, um, different ways to treat your uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether it's with some uh, dye or some alcohol in your, uh, through the groin in your uh, septal artery or whether it's open surgery. So, um, uh, and then with all the medical device companies here, we're constantly collaborating uh, on new and better ways to treat uh, valve disease um, without open heart surgery. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so another question from atten an attendee is, are there conditions that you see more frequently in women that require surgery? Uh, the answer is almost certainly yes, <laughs> but I don't have the exact uh, data for you. I just don't know. But um, women, we, and that's actually an area of interest that we uh, have developed or have uh, been working on here at the foundation is specific uh, heart disease um, in women. I don't have the, the exact numbers for you right now, but we are investigating it. Perfect. Thank you. So I think this is a great question to end off on. And thank you for everyone for submitting your questions. And again, Dr. Stefan, thank you for your time. Um, so what are you most hopeful for or excited about with the future of heart surgery? Uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of very smart, talented people in the field that are interested in finding new ways to treat almost uh, any heart condition that we have. The, the, more, the more research we do, we find out that, you know, no matter how old or what medical comorbidities you have, we can often help you with um, some therapy. So uh, just being able to help people live uh, longer, live um, uh, higher quality lives um, through sometimes um, simple procedures that just significantly can improve people's quality of life. So I think you know most of us go into this because we genuinely enjoy patient interaction and uh, helping people feel better. And I, I, this is just such a great field to be able to do that. Of course, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And thank you again for joining us. Is there any final words that you'd like to say before we invite uh, Dr. Sharkey back up? I don't think so. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, thank you, Bobby. That was uh, remarkably uh, inf informative and well done, and we're so happy to have you as part of our team. And if you want to see Dr. Stefan, I can tell you he is uh, he is happy to see you personally. And uh, we do talk with each amongst each other all the time, either formally at a conference or we uh, have each other's cell phones and ring each other up. So you're. You're, um, you're being well taken care of. I will, I will just gonna finish here by bragging a moment, if I could, that um, just a couple of years ago now, a team led by Dr. Paul Saraja, one of our partners, um, implanted the first mitral valve using a catheter-based technique in the United States successfully in a patient, uh, and that device is now the most uh, popular, or the most successful in the whole world at the moment for catheter-based replacement of the mitral valve. So we're, we're, we're um, a proud parents, so to speak, of that uh, uh, moment. Well, I'll finish with you by just saying thank you. Um, we appreciate your time. We, mostly, we appreciate your support. And we appreciate uh, the, the needs that you might have. And it, our contact information is listed here. Um, happy to talk to you at any time. So take care, everyone.